Okay, so I think we are good to go now. So first of all, thanks everyone for joining us. Today's webinar is for all of you guys who are either just starting to get into solvers or even those of you who have been using solvers for some time but feel like you're not getting that much out of it. Uh, especially when it comes to reviewing hands, it's really easy to fall into the trap of convincing yourself that you made the right play just because the solver takes the same action at some frequency. So if you've ever been guilty of this, then make sure you watch till the end because I'll be going over a bunch of examples where I show you guys how to use GTO Wizard or any other solver for that matter in a much more effective way. And even if you don't have a solver, you probably want to continue watching anyway because I'll also be talking about why solver work is so important in today's games and why you can't play good exploitative poker without having some kind of uh, GTO baseline. So without further ado, let's uh, get right into the first example. So hand number one, button raises, we call in the big blind, and the flop is king seven use. So facing a one third pot size C bet, let's say if we decide to check raise to about three and a half X and button calls, and eventually he shows down a hand like Jack Dan and Offsuit. I didn't put our hand into the question because it's not important. Right? The objective is to look at the hand that button shows down and think about how we can adjust uh, against the same player in future. So Jack Dan of Hearts, you know, without the backdoor flash off, obviously a, a pretty loose load. So how would you guys uh, adjust against this sort of uh, opponent who floats really wide versus a check race? So I'm going to start a poll here. And you guys can choose the option that you think makes the most sense. So A, do we only check raise value uh, and maybe some of our best bluffs uh, kind of makes sense since we're not, we don't seem to be getting a lot of hope. So maybe there's no point in uh, check raising hands that don't have much equity. And B, after getting called, barreling the turn more often also kind of makes sense since uh, our opponent is floating really wide on the flop. So a turn barrel should be quite effective uh, in terms of holding out all of his air. Or maybe you think that both A and B are correct or uh, D, none of the above. So I'll give everyone like a couple of minutes. So let's take a look at the results. Okay, it seems like the most popular option is to barrel the turn more often with bluffs after getting called. And the least popular option also happens to be the correct option, which is D, none of the above. So it sounds strange to say that, you know, we, we shouldn't be exploiting our opponent by making all of these adjustments, right? But uh, in fact, the reason why these are not, uh, these adjustments are not justified is because without knowing the GTO baseline, we cannot even say that Dylan is making a mistake. Like sure, it seems from our perspective that he's floating really wide when he calls hands like Jack 10 of Hearts, right? But if you take a look at the solver response, so let's pull up the sim in GTO wizard and take a look at what exactly the solver is calling against this three and a half X check rate. So what we see is that a hand like check 10 of hearts. So if we take a look at buttons response, is actually pretty much a pure call and uh, even check 10 offsuit, which is pretty much the same hand. Right? It's, it's all continuing at quite, quite a high, uh, frequency. So basically, you can't really say that you're exploiting your opponent by uh, check raising a more value heavy range or barreling the turn with more bluffs uh, because your opponent is in fact playing GTO. So there's nothing to exploit here. So that brings us to the, the first main point. Right? Without knowing GTO, we cannot even identify mistakes in our opponent's strategy. Right? Once again, things that look like mistakes to us might not objectively be mistakes in reality. And that's what the solver is for, is that to give us some kind of baseline and so that we can say if our opponent deviates from this baseline, then he is in fact making a mistake. So let's talk a little bit about why the solver actually floats so wide. So there's all kinds of reasons for this, right? First of all, Jack 10 of Hearts, despite not having a backdoor flash draw, it actually has pretty decent backdoor equity in the sense that uh, there's a couple of turns that actually give you an open-ender. So the, the queen gives you an open-ender. Uh, I believe the nine also gives you a double gutter. So you have like a little bit of backdoor equity. And on top of that, Jack 10 of Hearts specifically uh, is going to have like a little bit better blockers compared to offsuit combos. Because when you have two hearts in your range, you unblock all of these backdoor 
Flustro, hence like uh, Jack Nine of Jack Nine of Speeds, Jack Nine of Diamonds, right? hence like Ten Eight of Speeds and Diamonds that check race bluffing at some frequency. So it's kind of nice to have the cards since you allow your opponent to have more of these backdoor type hands and uh, there's just a little bit higher chance that you can steal the pot away from these hands on uh, later streets. Right? But the most important reason of all right, is really that big blind is supposed to check race extremely wide in this spot. Right? So again, looking at the big blinds, the, the GTO solution in terms of the big blind check raising range, right? what we see is a whole load of backdoor type hands, hands like 8.6 of spades, 8.5 uh, of spades, right? and these hands, uh, maybe they're not that difficult to find. I'm sure there are plenty of you guys who will check raise the same hand as well. But you know, on top of that, what you're going to see is hands like check 10 offsuit, 10 9 offsuit, right? hands like ace 5 offsuit getting in there at some frequency as well. And this is really something that it's very unlikely to be happening in practice, especially if you're playing uh, in softer games uh, as well as lower stakes games. So my point is that, you know, yes, the solver is floating pretty wide and it does call hands like Jack 10 or parts or without any kind of backdoor flush draw. But this doesn't mean that we actually want to float this hand in practice because the solver is only calling these hands under the assumption that the big blind is check raising appropriate range. And if you look at hands like, again, let's come back to the sim and we take a look at hands like Jack 10 offsuit, the EV of our hand, any hand that is mixing is basically zero EV. Otherwise, it would uh, just simply pick the higher EV option. So a hand like Jack 10 offsuit, you know, it's zero EV as a fold, zero EV as a call. And this is what we uh, refer to as indifference. That is, there's some kind of equilibrium here whereby this hand, the solver, is telling you that it's really close between those two options. And the equilibrium tends to be really sensitive. Right? In the sense that any kind of disturbance in your opponent's strategy uh, could potentially skew your decision all the way towards one end of the spectrum. Right. So in this case, if your opponent is not check raising enough bluffs, for example, a uh, hand like Jack Ten of Hats, that was originally indifferent. Right. Now it's just going to start favoring folding since it's not you're not up against a wide enough range, and there's really no reason to be floating these kinds of hands against check raising range that's much stronger than it should be, or even for that matter. Even if your opponent's check raising range is slightly stronger than it should be, right? it's still enough to upset this balance that you, you see here because the equilibrium is very sensitive. Right? If you imagine a seesaw that is equally weighted on both ends, even if you just add like feather on one side, right? chances are it's just going to topple all the way to one end. Right? And in this case, it's not even like a small mistake that your opponent is making. Right? Looking at the uh, GTO solution, right? chances are your actual opponents are going to be making like huge mistakes here in the sense that then the check raising nowhere near enough bluffs. So it's not even like close decision or anything with hands like check 10 of us and check 10 of suit. Right? It's pretty clear that we just want to be folding these hands. So congratulations to everyone who, who got the, who chose the last option, none of the other. Well done. Okay, so second poll has to do with, uh, because now we know that it's not a mistake for him to float check 10, right? So a more appropriate question to ask ourselves would be, uh, against opponents who will not float hands like Jack and offsuit. Right? So now we can uh, objectively say that he's making a mistake since GTO is calling hands like Jack and of Hards and Jack and offsuit sometimes, right? But our opponent is folding those hands. Right? So the question here is uh, what is the exploit, right? And can we exploit him by check raising hands such as uh, each six of diamonds, right? So again, I'm going to pull up the poll and give everyone a couple of minutes to, to think about this, right? So A, uh, true, he's overfolding, which makes our check raise plus EV, or do you think uh, it's false? It's six of diamonds, uh, since it's already a GTO check raise, uh, it doesn't qualify, you know, maybe it doesn't qualify as an exploit. So yeah, let me know what you guys think. Again, I'll just give everyone a couple of minutes. Yeah, the same, same flops, King 7 use rainbow. So 8-6 of diamonds would be a backdoor straight drop plus backdoor plus drop. Okay, so the more popular answer is B, 8-6 of diamonds is already a GTO check raise, so it doesn't qualify as an exploit. There's also some guys who, who chose the, the first option, but it's actually B, which is Correct, you know, 8-6. It's not really uh, an exploit because the, the solver is 
what we're going to see is that the solver is check raising this hand at some uh, frequency or probably most of the time, in fact. So even if you were to check raise this hand, it's not really an exploit, right? It would just be playing GTO and you're not really punishing your opponent for overfolding versus the check raise, right? If, if anything, if you fail to check raise this hand, then it would be a, a mistake, right? And your opponent should be overfolding, right? But check raising this hand, it's, you can't say that it's a mistake because what we see is that the solver is in fact raising this hand at quite a high uh, frequency. So 86 of diamonds over here. What you see is that it's raising like around 80% of the time. And uh, therefore, it doesn't count as an exploit, right? So it's also, uh, you guys can also think about what it means in this case to be exploiting your opponent, right? So Tiago says we can exploit by check raising 100% of the time with this combo. So very good. That is, in fact, correct. And we can exploit our opponent's overfolds by uh, increasing the frequency of these check raises right? and including hands like ace five offsuit, like jack ten offsuit, the most direct way of punishing our opponent's overfolds would just be to check raise these hands more often or perhaps even all the time. Right? Because if we just play GTO, right? so GTO is check raising eight six of diamonds most of the time. And if we do that and we just stop that, then our opponent's check ten is going to be indifferent between both options, right? You can he can call, he can fold. Both options are worth about the same. Uh, how we make calling better than folding is by check raising more than GTO. So this brings us to the second important point of today's webinar. Right? The first point we, we looked at, uh, we talked about was that without knowing GTO, we cannot identify mistakes in our opponent's strategy. Right? The second point here is that without knowing GTO, we not only are unable to identify mistakes, we also cannot say that we are exploiting our opponent. Because once again, you know, what we perceive as an exploit could just be GTO. So there's definitely going to be players who feel like they are, they're playing pretty loose by check raising hands like 8 of, of diamonds, right? It's just like a backdoor straight draw, backdoor flash draw, right? But that is in fact GTO. And uh, the exploit is actually something that is much more extreme, right? Which is to check raise hands like ace five offsuit, right? Just a naked overcut as well as a backdoor straight draw. Right, those hands are also indifferent between like raising and calling and folding. So a uh, logical adjustment would just be to increase the frequency of the raise, right? perhaps even raise 100% if you think that your opponent is um, like overfolding. Right? Once again, the equilibrium tends to be very sensitive. And even if our opponent is overfolding by a little bit, what's going to happen is uh, hands like ace 5 suit. they're just preferring to check raise in the sense that check raising will be higher EV than folding. And, and therefore, we should just pick the higher EV option all the time. So something interesting to think about is that, you know, what, what if we have hands that are pure folds, such as check five of hearts, just pure error, right? Should we check raise those as well? So hands that are supposed to be folding all of the time in theory, right? What, what do you guys think about check raising these kinds of hands? And do you think it's acceptable to do this or maybe maybe it's a little bit too out of line? Only if they overfold a lot. Okay, someone says check raising is acceptable if the EV is close to zero, and that is yeah. Mo most of the answers are quite spot on. It definitely has to do with how definitely has to do with the EV difference between check raising as well as folding. So in this case, if we look at the hand like uh, okay, let's look at jack five of spades first. And uh, what you see is that raising. Okay, so jack five of spades, for example, uh, what we see is that raising is worth negative zero point one, two chips, and then folding is worth zero. So we'll, we're only losing 10% uh, of the big blind right, by check raising this hand. So it's definitely not a huge mistake. And uh, if your opponent was overfolding by a big enough margin, raising could definitely be become higher EV than folding. So it's all about, uh, so as, as you guys, many of you guys pointed out in the chat, right? it's really all about how big of an EV difference there is between raising as well as folding, right? If the EV difference is small enough, for sure, we can start to uh, justify raising this hand, assuming that our opponent is overfolding by a big enough margin. Right? And then hands like jack five of hearts, right? There's a little bit bigger of an EV loss. When you start raising this hand, you lose about half a big blind. So it's a little bit harder to justify doing that, but could still be reasonable if your opponent was overfolding by a huge margin. Uh, but that said, I don't really uh, advocate, right? T typically, I don't advocate raising these kinds of pure folks on the turn because there's 
there's other considerations that you have to take into account as well, right? You have to think about the times that your opponent, you know, if, if you check raise a hand like jack five of cards, and let's say your opponent sees you show down this hand, immediately he's going to start adjusting because he's going to know right off the bat that you're just out of line. Here, right? Maybe the next time around, he'll start tightening up uh, in terms of his sea batting range. Uh, he's probably going to float more against your check raise as well. Uh, whereas if you check raise something like eight, six of diamonds, right, that is like supposed to be mixing in theory, and then you just increase your frequency to 100%, right? it's not going to look as out of line. And there's a lower chance that your opponent is going to start adjusting and start trying to uh, counter exploit you. There's like a nice children's story that I like to use here to like explain this, this type of reasoning. I'm not sure if any of you guys have heard of the story of the golden goose. Right? Imagine if you have a goose that lays golden eggs, right? would you kill the goose and eat it? Like that's just going to be a uh, super minus EV. Right? Like why would you kill the ghost when, goose when it's just going to, when you could just like keep it and keep on that thing at least golden eggs and maybe you can sell the eggs and buy more geese with, with the money. Right? So check raising a hand like Jack Five of Pets, in a way that's like killing the golden goose because once your opponent sees you show down this hand and he catches on to what you're doing, right? you're going to lose like a very plus EV spot in future. So what we're really doing is we're thinking about our future EV as well. Right? If, if, our, if it's possible for us to, um, for our opponent to not catch on to what we're doing, then we can continue to exploit him for a small amount of EV uh, over a very long period of time. Right? But the moment we check race track five of cards and we show this hand down, right, we're going to lose this uh, plus EV spot all together. Right? So if you consider your future EV as well, probably not the best idea to race these kinds of hands, uh, unless of course if it's an anonymous game, right? then that's not really a concern. And you know you, you could probably justify check raising this if your opponent was overfolding by a big enough margin. Okay, so different types of players. Right? Uh, level one would be players who don't have a good grasp of GTO. So this is probably like 80% of the player pool, right? Not just because like people don't study with solvers or anything, right? There's plenty of players who study with solvers, but most guys, especially those who are a little bit newer to solvers, they tend to focus on a lot of the noise, right? Um, stuff like blockers and so on. It's, it's very eye-catching right? in the sense that, you know, it feels good when you can break down and understand these things. But you know, at the end of the day, there's, there's other things that contribute more in terms of your win rate compared to the blockers, right? For example, understanding uh, whether your opponent is, is like check raising enough bluffs in, in a certain spot. Yeah. So GTO is difficult by, by nature, right? And that's the reason why most players level one, right? Not necessarily because they don't work with solvers, but uh, because it's, even if you do work with solvers, it's very difficult to understand how the equilibrium works in like every single spot that you, you might come across. And then level two, you have players who know GTO and who just play accordingly. So going along with the same uh, example of the King Seven Deuce Rainbow Bot, right? These are guys who um, like maybe they see that the solver is floating hands like check ten of cards against the check race. Right? And then the next time they encounter the same spot, uh, they just blindly call check ten of cards. Right? And obviously that's not ideal, uh, especially if you are playing um, like lower stakes or even mistakes for the net, right? It's very unlikely that the population is going to be check raising enough for you to justify floating so wide on the top. Right? So sometimes a little bit of theory right, can actually hurt you more than knowing none at all because the level one player is probably just going to fold check 10 of cards against the check race. Right? But because the level two player has seen this hand uh, being floated in the solver, right, he starts like, calling these kinds of hands and floating really wide and ends up losing a bunch of EV. So where we really want to be is level three. Right? Level three, these are the players who are at the top of the food chain. Right? They know GTO and instead of blindly imitating the solver, they use GTO and think about how to exploit their opponents. So first of all, a level three player is going to know, he's going to understand that uh, hands like Jackson of Pats should not be floated in practice because population is under check raising. Right? But the advantage that the level three player has over the level one player is that the time that he is in the big blind, right, what he can do is check raise more bluffs relative to the GTO strategy. Right? So that includes hands like uh, 10-9 offsuit and ace-5 offsuit. 
Uh, hence that the level one player will not check race. So this is how the level three player uh, gains EV over players who don't have a good grasp of GTO and who don't understand how uh, a certain spot works in theory. Right? So at the end of the day, it's always going to be the player who, um, you know, if, if you understand a certain spot and how it works in theory, you're always going to be in a much better position to exploit your opponents. Okay, so uh, next question. Uh, once again, on the same King's Seven Deuce Rainbow Bot, we're facing wanted range pet. So previously, we were talking about what to do with our bluffs, right? So for example, hands like 8-6 of diamonds, right? Hands like ace-5 offsuit. Uh, we know that because population is overfolding, right? We can increase our raising frequency with those hands. And it's uh, quite intuitive, something that's quite easy to understand in the sense that if your opponent is overfolding, it, the most direct way to punish the overfold is to throw in more bluffs into your check raising range. Right? But we haven't really considered what to do with our main hands. Right? Stuff like top pair, middle pair, that's also supposed to be getting check raised at some uh, frequency. So hand like king queen, for example, is probably indifferent uh, in theory. So against someone who is likely to be overfolding against a check race. Right? What do you guys think we should do with king queen? Should we always race? Should we always call? Or should we mix it up with our head? So the most popular option is to always call and that is in fact the correct uh, answer. So 4E544 says in the chat, if this hand is indifferent, then overfolding makes it minus EV. Correct idea, but not technically correct because this hand is plus EV for sure, no matter what you do, right? You have a lot of EV as a call. You have a lot of EV as a race, right? Probably what you mean is that if your opponent is overfolding and failing to defend hands like Jack 10 offsuit, then a hand like King Queen uh, is going to be slightly lower EV as a race since you're just getting like less value the times that you raise. So uh, if if you can imagine that the EV of raising goes down even by a little bit, we're just going to start preferring to call. So that's why the correct answer is in fact B to, to always call. So let's, yeah, so admin says the overflow mix raising this hand bad. Yeah, that, that's true. Definitely, it's not it's not ideal to be raising this hand and then, you know, it's not ideal for your opponent to be holding stuff like check 10. So here, if we look at what Big Blind is doing with King Queen, right, this hand is basically indifferent to both options, right? But because our opponent is making the mistake of uh, under-defending against the, against the check race, right? so every combo of check 10 that he folds right, is going to decrease the EV of uh, check raising a hand like King Queen, since what we what we want is for these hands to call all the time, right? We're getting like plenty of value uh, against a hand that doesn't have like that many outs against us, or we probably have like ninety something percent equity uh, against this hand. And if our opponent fails to defend these hands, then it just means that the EV of raising is uh, going to be much lower. So whenever the moral of the story is that anytime you see a hand that is mixing, right, instead of just you know, let's, say, let's say if you were reviewing this hand, you know, you, you have King Queen from the big blind and then you're, you're facing the seabed. And let's say you decide to check raise this time and you're looking in the solver to, to see if you made a mistake. And the solver says that you're supposed to be mixing with this hand. Right? Don't just stop there and move on to the next hand. Right? What you really need to be thinking about is uh, you, you need to look at, you know, instead of looking at your own side of the strategy, you need to look at your opponent's response versus the race as well as your opponent's response the times that you call right what's he going to do on the turn for example and all of these things will affect the ev of calling as well as raising so you want to pay particular attention to potential mistakes that your opponent is making and when i say mistake what i mean is a deviation from gto so an example would be our opponent uh, failing to defend hands like jackson of Fats. Right, that is a mistake in the sense that uh, GTO is defending this hand, but you know, chances are your opponents are not going to be floating so wide on the flop. Right? And how this mistake affects the EV of raising King Queen is that it goes down, right? since you're just basically getting less value. And mistakes on later streets can also affect our EV. So, so far we've considered the EV of raising with King Queen, and we've talked about why it tends to be a little bit lower in practice compared to GTO. But 
we also need to consider the EV of calling, right? Because it's it's possible that our opponent is making certain mistakes that also decrease the EV of calling, right? And in that case, our decision would still be pretty close because the EV of raising is lower, but so is the EV of calling. Let's take a look at our opponent's response or what his strategy is supposed to look like uh, after we check call on the block. So uh, if the big blind calls here, and let's let's take a look at uh, what happens on the average turn. Okay, so let me just make this full screen. So if the big blind checks the turn, uh, here what we see is the button strategy on all the different possible runouts. Right. So let let's start off by taking a look at the button's bet size or the kind of sizings that he's supposed to use in theory. So here we see that uh, the most common size is the overbet. And the pot is 9.1 chips and 21.5% of the time, uh, the button is betting the turn for around 12, 12 big blinds, right? 12 big blinds into a pot of nine big blinds. Uh, the smaller sizes do get used a little bit, but not as much as the, the big one. Right? So we need to ask ourselves the question, right? Is this a realistic assumption in practice? Particularly if you're playing lower stakes, right, 50 NL, 25 NL, uh, do you guys think that there's going to be so much overbetting on that? Yes or no? Okay, I think everyone everyone agrees that you know, overbets are kind of rare in these kinds of games, right? People don't really understand that you know it's you need to be using big bets to extract the maximum amount of value, right? If you have something that's really strong, right? There's this idea that we need to size down to try and get called a little bit more often right? and that's probably why these kinds of bets are kind of rare or it could just be because people are not really exposed to solvers right if you've never worked with solvers before i guess this does look kind of uh, surprising at first right but it's super common in spots where the turn is a blank especially because here the button just has like a huge uh nut advantage big player has check raise almost all of his strong hands on the flop so the big bet is there to uh, leverage this nut advantage and to put maximum pressure on the big blinds bluff catches uh, because the fact is that most of the big blinds range is just going to be bluff catches so th this is definitely a mistake in the sense of a deviation from gto right mistake number one the times that we call king queen on the flop population is not using big enough bets on the turn right? and then mistake number two right let's take a look at some specific turns right so if we have um uh, and uh the tree of spades on the turn Right? And you take a look at the buttons strategy here. Uh, does anyone notice anything that is maybe not that realistic? What do you think most of your opponents will do with hands like top pair? Okay, Zola says they're probably betting like three quarter spot. So we've talked about bet, the bet size already, right? Probably people are just not betting big enough with, with these kinds of hands. Okay, James says they will probably bet top pair with weaker kicker. Matthias says they would never check. I, I, Definitely agree, right? Maybe they do check like once in a while, right? But definitely not as often as what the solver is doing here, right? Because look at what's happening here. The solver is pure checking every combo of King X, uh, King Nine and below, right? This is kind of unrealistic, you know, especially if the, there's like a flush row on the board, right? The way that uh, a lot of players tend to think is that they just want to bet their top pair before like the flush comes in on the, the river. Right? It's just an easier way to play the hand because there's this uh, it's probably just psychology right people don't like making difficult decisions so they don't want to check here and then have like some kind of bad card come on the river and now they face a bet and they're not sure what to do right whereas if you just bet this hand on the turn it's really easy to play right because if the bad card comes on the river you, you can just check behind and you don't have to worry about making any kind of difficult decision right but of course the the easiest play might not always be the best play and what the solver does is it checks these hands a lot even the stronger kickers such as and uh, like ace this region of ace king king queen it's doing quite a bit of checking king check checking almost half the time as well so that's mistake number two right? uh, missing number one is that your opponent is probably not using big enough bet sizes mistake number two is that he's probably betting a little bit too often with top pair right so who can tell me how these mistakes affect the EV of calling with King Queen on the flop? So let's say if we have 
king queen and we're facing a seabed and we know that the times that we call our opponent is going to not use big enough sizes on the turn and also bet too thin for value with worse top pair okay most of you guys say that the ev will hmm, it's kind of mixed actually some some people say it goes up some people say that it goes down i would actually argue that it goes up right because it's um yeah maybe, maybe it's not that clear right so let, let me elaborate on on this a little bit right uh the reason why that your ev goes up right is because first of all um you know let, let's talk about the mistake of betting of button betting like too thin for value with weaker top pair right i think this is something that clearly increases your ev right the times that you call your opponent is going to be putting in so much more money with worse hands right if a hand that if a hand like king six is supposed to be checking all the time and then now it's putting in more money uh that can only be a, a good thing right you're, you're just getting more value from hands that are worse than you right your opponent is value betting too thin and that's going to increase the ev of king queen right? as for the mistake of betting of failing to bet big enough right this is a little bit less clear but the main thing to understand here is that uh the hands that are betting like really big right most of them they're supposed to be really strong hands right like sets and two pairs over pairs hands like ace king right so in theory you're supposed to lose a lot against these hands because right? they're going to be using a much bigger size and you know the solver is also going to throw in a whole bunch of bluffs such that your, your hand is just indifferent like calling and folding Right. But in practice, if your opponent is not using the overbet, then you're going to lose a lot less the times that you run into a hand like aces or, or pocket sevens. Right. So you're kind of getting the best of both worlds here. Right. Not only do you save a lot of money the times that you run into a stronger hand, but you're also getting a lot of uh you're also getting your opponent to put in more money with hands that you actually beat. So the EV of calling on the flop is going to go way up. This uh, mix that you see here, right? This is a problem with just um, like copying what the solver does, right? Imagine like a level two player who looks at this and then the next time he finds himself in this spot against a small seabed, right? He Maybe he randomizes and check raises king, queen, half the deck, right? Every time he check raises his hand, he's probably going to be losing like a couple of big points, right? Because there's so many reasons why the EV of calling is higher than the EV of raising, right? First of all, opponent is not defending enough versus a check raise which decreases the EV of raising and then secondly the times that you call it is making all of these mistakes that uh, increase the EV of calling so it's a huge huge mistake to be check raising king queen uh hands like king queen and king jack in uh specifically in the lower stakes game right so don't don't do this right like uh, and in general don't just copy what the solver does right it's really important to once again, think in terms of uh, the kinds of mistakes that your opponent is making, right? Just because your hand is mixing in theory and it has the same EV in theory, very rarely it's going to have the same EV in practice. Right? Almost all the time, one option is going to be higher than the other. And it's very important to uh, think about like which option is superior based on the kinds of mistakes that your opponent's making, right? So always think in terms of your opponent's mistakes instead of looking at your own side of the strategy. Right. You want to pay attention to Dylan's end of the strategy and to try and see if there's anything unrealistic that uh, you might notice about the solver solution. Because every mistake that your opponent makes is going to affect the EV of your various options, right. including mistakes on later streets, as we as we saw in the previous example. Okay, so next example. Uh, this one is an early position hand. So hero raises from the low jack with AC suited. The big blind calls. Big blind checks the flop. We get this uh, eight seven deuce two tone flop. So we, we flop top at top kicker. Big blind check calls. Turn is a blank, a three of hearts. It goes check check. So we decide to, to check our top pair here. And on the river, the seven pairs and the big blind over bets, right? He bets 20 big blinds into a pot of 13 big blinds. So the question here is how inclined will you guys be to bluff catch this spot? So A, we have good blockers and, and also big blind has like 20 of misdraws, right? So maybe that is enough to make us want to bluff catch or b big blind is likely to be under bluffing especially for, for such a, a big size right so once again i'll give you guys a few minutes maybe i will shift the slide back to uh previous one 
just so that you guys can see the board. And what stake is this assumed to be not so important? It's more of like a general idea that you guys can, can use when it comes to uh, bluff catching. It seems like everyone loves to, to bluff catch this time. Okay, Tiago says that we beat value bets. Ah, you're referring to uh, seven. Yeah, probably not going to be four to seven because yes, we, we beat uh, value, but probably a head like AC is not going to, um, not really going to beat any value for this size. Uh, Tombo says it's a station, so they're definitely calling. Okay. <laughs> I remember not, not to bluff against you in the future. So most popular answer is eight. Right? Uh, most of you guys seem to want to call this hand and it turns out that this is a situation where like it's really not not such a great spot to be bluff catching right it doesn't have so much to do with the the bet size even right it's it's more about you know going along the same lines of um, what it means for your opponent to make a mistake right yes big Knight has plenty of misdraws but the question that we really need to be asking ourselves is um like is it a mistake for him to be bluffing all of those misdraws, right? Even if he has a ton of misdraws, but let's say you look up the spot in the solver and you see that all of the misdraws are supposed to be bluffing. Alone, you know, it doesn't justify like just calling AC. Right? Since your opponent's not making a mistake, right? Yes, he's bluffing all of his misdraws, but that's what he's supposed to do, right? Whereas if this is a situation where your opponent is like, let's say you look up the spot in the solver and then you see that he is not supposed to be bluffing all of his misdraws, right? Then you can say that uh, this is a good spot to bluff catch, right? If Big Blind has plenty of misdraws and the solver is not bluffing uh, all of those draws. Okay, so let, let me pull up this in, right? Just to elaborate a little bit on what I mean. And we can take a look at uh, Big Blind's strategy after the turn goes uh, check, check. So what we see here is that we are. Getting almost all of our range, right? but around 80% of our range. It's a little bit confusing to look at this uh, hand grid. So what I like a, a nice tip that you can use is to look at the breakdown instead. Like here, it's much easier to figure out what's uh, what's going on. Right? Particularly if you look at the air hands in the big blinds range. Right? King high as well as hands that have no showdown value. Right. The solver is betting these hands all the time. So this is what I was uh, talking about earlier. Right. If Even if there's a whole bunch of misdraws on the board um, and you think your opponent is betting all of them, right? that alone doesn't justify bluff catching a hand like uh, Ace-8 because that's, in some cases, that's just what your opponent is supposed to be doing. So let's look at in positions response versus this over bet and look at what Ace-8 is doing. Right. So uh, what we see here is AC, King 8, Pocket 9, they're all indifferent to calling or folding. Right? It is calling most of the time, but that's not the main point. Right? The main point is that the EV of calling is close to zero. Right? So once again, with these kinds of hands that are mixing, right, what you don't want to do is just like look at this hand and say, oh, the solver is mixing, so it doesn't matter what I do with it. Right? The correct approach is to instead look at your opponent's strategy, right? Because this hand is mixing against the GTO strategy. And what you need to figure out now is if your opponent is deviating from GTO, right? And that could potentially affect the EV of calling, right? The EV of folding is always going to be zero, right? So the question here is really whether or not calling is plus EV. And that really just depends on your opponent's value bluff ratio, right? If you can identify uh, certain mistakes in the strategy, right? Then that could uh, definitely affect your decision. So in this case, right, because his air hands are supposed to be bluffing all the time, right, it, it's very difficult for him to make the mistake of over bluffing. Right? Think, think about it like this. Right? Let's say if um, if you were in the big blind right, and you guys were playing against me and I'm I'm in the low check with AC or whatever bluff catcher that I have and I, I tell you that I'm just going to fold this hand all of the time. I'm going to fold all of my bluff catches. Right. What would you guys, what do you think you guys can do to exploit me? Uh, yes, very good. RV says turn ASI into a bluff. Yeah. Is there anything else that you can do to exploit me without bluffing ASI? Can you exploit me by bluffing all of your missed bluff draws? Uh, yeah, there's some very creative answers here, right? Bluff smaller, check all of your strong hands, right? Very good. Those are all 
valid options, but you know, you guys can see where I'm going with this, right? It's very difficult to uh, be overbluffing without getting creative here, right? because most players are just going to check the screen, right? It doesn't make so much sense to turn the screen into a bluff when the bot pairs and you have so much uh, showdown value, right? And this is the reason why this is not that great of a spot to be bluff catching, right? Even if you fold all of your bluff catchers that are indifferent versus the overbet, right? There's very little that your opponent can do to punish you, right? You, you have to turn stuff like ASI and into a bluff, right? That would be the most direct way that he could um, take advantage of your mistake, right? Whereas if you decide to bluff catch here with AC, right? You're, you're kind of getting free roll, right? In the sense that there's very little that your opponent can do to over bluff, right? But it's certainly possible that he's under bluffing, right? Maybe he is just giving up with, with a bunch of like missed flash trucks, right? Players nowadays are quite obsessed with uh, Blockers, right? So maybe if your opponent has something like a uh, check nine of diamonds and then he says, Oh, I, I, I should give up this hand because I block like the miss flash draw and then I block like some miss straight draws as well. Right? Of course, that's probably doesn't apply in a spot like this, right? But what my point is that there are certainly players who will think this way. And then once he fails to bluff a hand like jack nine, right off the bat, he's going to be under bluffing, right? And you know, your, your call is just going to become minus EV as a result. So the exploit of folding a hand like ACID here against an overbet is actually pretty safe in the sense that there's nothing much your opponent can do to counter exploit you. Right? And that's that's the reason why like I would personally just fold this hand like hundred percent of the time. Right? I wouldn't even bluff catch it at some frequency because I'm confident that uh, the EP of calling is, is just gonna be less than zero, or at best it's just going to be zero, right? Even if the big blind bluffs all of his air. Right, then yes, my hand is zero EV. Right? But if that's the case, then what's the point of calling? Right? I'm just getting free roll, basically. Right? If, if my opponent is playing GTO, then yeah, it, my call is okay, right? It's like mediocre call. Uh, if my opponent is like under bluffing, then I'm just making a minus EV call, right? And it's so, so unlikely that he's actually going to be over bluffing here. Yeah, so um seems like quite a contentious question. I don't think everyone really agrees with me but hopefully i've convinced most of you okay let me take a look at some of the replies so steve says that there are some players who might not be betting so big with strong hands okay so fair point right that's something that's potentially a consideration as well if you are not expecting to receive a bluff from miss draws on the river checking turn seems like a bad play okay so that's not necessarily true because you don't know that the river is going to be a seven right what what if the river was an ace instead, right? Then now it is going to be a very different kind of uh, situation, right? If we take a look at, yeah, I, I guess I haven't really explained like why the big blank has to bluff all of his air on the seven, right? It's really because the seven is a fantastic run out for him, right? The three and the seven, especially, right? The three doesn't uh, improve any of the in position players overcuts as well as you know the seven, obviously we're going to have like a whole lot more trips compared to the early position player. So in situations like these, where we have a big region of value hands, right? We have all of these trips and even 8x is, is strong enough to, to make like a small bet. Right? And all of these value hands that we're betting, right? Especially if a lot of them can go for a bigger size, right? Then that's always going to allow us to bluff a lot. Because the bigger that we bet with hands like 7x, for example, right? if we start over betting with these hands, our opponent is going to be getting terrible products. Right? And what we need to do to compensate for these products is to bluff more. So that's why the solver is bluffing so much on this kind of runoff because Big Blind has like enough value hands that are betting for a big enough size to support all of these bluffs. Right? But if the runoff is different, let's say if it was an ace instead of a seven, right? then what we're going to see is something very different. Right? Look at what the uh, air hands are doing here. Right? King High is checking all the time. Even if we have like a hand without any showdown value, it doesn't mean that we get to bluff all the time now right? because the runout is much worse for us where right? the ace hits in position much harder than it hits us. So there's a very limited amount of hands that we get to value bet. Right? At the end of the day, your bluffs are just there to make sure that your value hands get paid off. Right? And if you don't have enough value hands, then you're obviously not going to be allowed to, to bet all of your bluffs. Right? And then the more value hands you have, especially if they can bet for a pretty big size, right? You're going to be allowed to bluff more. So in this kind of situation, uh, it's kind of the opposite of the previous 
revert the previous example. Right? Here, it would be a much more reasonable spot to bluff edge because now it's very possible that your opponent could be over bluffing. Right? At least it's it's physically possible for him to over bluff. Right? He just has to let a hand like knight hand, for example. You can see knight hand of spades is supposed to be a pure check. Right? But the moment your opponent starts betting these hands, right, he's going to be over bluffing. Right? So this is a much more reasonable spot to be bluff catching compared to the previous one because it's um, your opponent basically has more room to be making mistakes. So in conclusion, GTO is, uh, we want to think about GTO as a baseline, helps us identify mistakes in our opponent's strategy, first of all, right? because without a GTO baseline, we can't even say that our opponent is making mistakes. Right? Without GTO, we wouldn't, we'll be pretty lost in terms of how to adjust as well. Right? But if we have some kind of GTO baseline, then we can say that you know if my opponent does this, he's making a mistake because it's a deviation from GTO. Right? And uh, it also tells us which direction in which to adjust because we can think about um, how his mistakes affect the EV of our hand. Right? And let's say if he's folding too much and right? we have some kind of bluff that is uh, indifferent to like raising and folding in theory, right? then we can see that the EV of raising is now higher than the, the EV of folding. So that's what the solver is for, right? Is that to help you, first of all, identify mistakes in your opponent's strategy. And then secondly, if you think about it a little bit, right, you often find ways to uh, exploit those mistakes that your opponents are making. So when uh, reviewing hands, especially, right, don't just stop there. If a hand is mixing, you got to look at villain's side of the strategy and think about all the mistakes and all the ways that he's deviating from GTO, right? Think about how they affect the EV of your various options. And then from there, there's going to be some situations where you find that one option is like way higher EV than the other. So you can just pick that option all the time where right? you don't have to mix it up when you know that one option is superior to, to the others. Right? And finally, when used correctly, solvers become very powerful exploitative weapons. And I hope I have uh, demonstrated that right, in, in this presentation. Thanks for watching and I'll, I'll see you guys again soon.